unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word.
You may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him he is the most high God. Turn to the next neighbor and tell him he is the most high God. He is the most high God. He is the most high God. We honor the presence of the men and women of God in the house. I will not mention names because I'm unworthy to 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 untie their laces. But I'm very humbled to have everyone here. Somebody clap for Jesus. Some of them are too humble that they had to sit behind. Somebody clap for them. <laughs> they found no, need no robbery to be like unto God, but they humbled themselves even as they sitting in the back chairs. And for such they were given a name. <laughs> Above every name, out of the sound of that name, Kampala Road bows. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, Kulika anniversary. Tell your neighbor, thank you for the anniversary. We want to give a special thank you to every person who fully participated. Come on. Come on, clap for them. The choir, the intercessors, the the ushers, the those who brought five, those who didn't bring, those who came. You can imagine what next year is going to look like. Even me, I'm scared. (laughs) Hallelujah. The Lord has spoken to me something. We're entering another season. Fanero is going to go beyond what you know it. Praise the Lord. Pray for us. We are working on leaving this place. We're getting a bigger space. Hallelujah. We've also extended the, the overflow. So don't worry to invite people to come. Some of you say, ah, if you get there by this that you're not going to get a seat. We created some more seats out there, okay? So you can invite people to come. But we're working on something uh, in a few weeks by the grace of God. We shall be sorted. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Has the Lord done great things in your life? Even today he's going to do. Praise the Lord. Somebody say, I believe. Today, God is doing a wonderful thing in my life. Say it again, I believe. Today, that God is doing a wonderful thing in my life. Say amen. Where is Bran? Bran Westigate. Bran Westigate. Is he around or he's outside? Bran, quickly hurry. Don't worry, I have time. Bran Westigate. Why are you clapping? He's not getting married. Come. Come. I guess you're asking yourself why I called you. This is why I called you. You're smart. When I grow up, I want to be like you. The Lord spoke to me about this man a few days ago. And I conferred not with flesh and blood, 
neither went I up to Jerusalem. The Lord spoke to me about you. And before this congregation, I ask you to officially, from today, address this man as a man of God and a pastor. in this ministry. Listen. He is a man of God and a pastor in this ministry. So, you're going to continue with your ministry, but from today, I never want to see you sit far from me. I always want you here. Praise God. Somebody stretch your hands towards him. By reason of the anointing vested upon my life, by reason of the grace bestowed in my spirit, the unction of calling operating on my life. Brian Mwesige from today, you're more than a called, you're a chosen to be a pastor in this ministry, a teacher of the word and officially. I release that anointing upon your life. Be separated for the work which Christ has called you. The wicked and unreasonable will be far away from you in the name of Jesus. Every tongue that raises against you shall be held in judgment. You will function in simplicity, in glory, and in power. Many things around you I see are changing from today. And the things that fought me will not fight you. The things that made me weep will not make you weep. The stories that were said of us in the testimony of the glory of God shall be said about you. Your name will be voiced abroad, not only in this land, but the lands of the world. Nations shall yield their fruit and substance to you. They shall yield their strength to you. Signs, miracles, and wonders will follow you. Glory is imparted in your spirit today to minister in a peace and power like you've never seen before. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Praise God. Hallelujah. Allow me to preach. Today I had another thing to share but something hit my spirit and I shared it with a a few folk um, and I felt that I should share it today. I touched it. I just touched it. I didn't go so deep. But I touched it and I felt that I should share it with a few folk. I shared it with a few folk, but I felt the Lord give me that. He started to expound and expound and expound and expound and expound until I could not hold it anymore. So I, I felt I should share it. Hallelujah. John chapter 11, verse 41. If you're there, you say, Amina. In Luganda. John 11:41. The Bible says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And the next verse says, And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I say it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had that spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, as and in his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, unto them, Lose him and let him go. Somebody say amen. amen. Many of you are familiar with the story of Lazarus, the friend of Jesus Christ. 
The Bible tells us that Lazarus one time fell sick and they came to the master and tell him that thy, the one that you love is sick. And Jesus said that Lazarus' sickness shall not end in death. But it shall be as unto the glorification of the name of our Lord. But Lazarus physically died. The Bible says he comes back four days in the tomb, meets Martha on the way. She tells them, if thou had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus tells her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And then he went out and the Bible says he started to reach out to Mary. Where is Mary? And Mary wept. And the Bible says when he saw them which were with Mary weeping, the Bible says he groaned in the spirit. And he asked, where hast thou laid him? Then he goes to the tomb, to the grave. There was a stone there. And the scriptures tell us, he goes in front of that grave and said, Father, I thank you. 41. He says, they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and says, Father, I thank thee. He said, that thou hast heard me. When did he pray? When he groaned. Praise the Lord. When he groaned, it was the prayer. And the next line says, And I knew that thou hearest me always. Underline that. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I say it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Number one, if there were no people next to the Christ, Lazarus would have been raised without speaking anything. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So I'm trying to deal with tradition. Because when Jesus goes in every society, he becomes something. When he goes to the Jew, he becomes tradition. When he goes to the Greek, he becomes philosophy. When he goes to the Roman, he becomes a religion. When he goes to some European places, he becomes an enterprise. So some people inculcate their own cultures along that definition of Christ. And when he's among them, everyone has their own understanding and definition. And sadly, many things surround the way we think God functions and works without understanding the full extent of his mind. And that is why the Bible speaks of the wisdom of a prudent man. To know the way of God. To know the way of God. To know the way of God. You get to a point where you know the way. The ways are revealed, but the way. So the way determines the ways. The ways is healing. The ways is deliverance. The ways is answered prayer. The ways are those things that start to come and happen in your life. As a testimony of his goodness. But there is a way that he does them. And that's the wisdom of the prudent. I always say those things. There's certain things I repeat over and over. Not because you do not know them. But because they need to sink in your spirit. When you understand the way of God. You realize that life is not a prediction. Life is not guessing. Ministry is not luck. Marriage is not luck. Business is not luck. Education is not luck. Purpose does not work with luck. Praise the Lord Jesus. Look at the ultimate ministry of the Christ pertaining to your life. He says, and you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to, and to what? Good works. He says, for which you were before ordained. The word the ordination is anointed. For which you were before anointed that you should walk in them. Give me the amplified of that. The amplified says, for we are God's own handiwork. I love it. His workmanship recreated. In Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do, listen, those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged, made ready for us. Your life is not a mistake. You don't just pray. You don't just come to Fanero. You don't just preach on the streets. You don't just send a message to somebody. You don't just read a devotional. No. There was a pre-arrangement. There was a pre-ordination upon your life to walk in a certain life. Hallelujah. Pre-arranged. And the Bible says it was made ready for us to live. That's the mind of God. He does not create the man and then create sustainability. No. He creates sustainability and then creates the man. Remember how he was dealing with Adam? He created everything Adam needed. After Adam gets everything, he comes on scene. He enters the garden with everything available. That's the life of salvation. 
You enter the life of salvation with everything available. You have been blessed. You will not be. You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have been given, not will be, have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. Through the what? Through the what? The hypnosis of him that has called us unto glory and virtue. Next verse. According as, whereby as we are given unto us what? Great and precious promises and by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and besides this giving all diligence you add your faith faith virtue knowledge and these things praise the lord now it means that when god god says you have been when you became born again you enter the finished work you enter the life where your education was finished, your marriage was finished, your business was finished, your ministry was fini- finished, your success was finished. And, and the life of salvation is to walk in what he has prearranged. You understand? The life of salvation is walking into what God has prearranged. Whether you want it or not, it's available. Whether somebody says it or they don't say it, it's there. Whether you feel it or you don't feel it, it's up to you. But it's according to his knowledge. There's a knowledge that he reveals. Praise the Lord. That's the essence of the Holy Spirit. He's honest. The Bible says that he's that seal. We were sealed with him till the time of redemption. He is the guarantee or the security of those things that are freely given unto us by God. So, understand number one that the life of salvation is entering into rest. Why? Because everything you need has been done. Somebody say amen. Everything you need in this world has been given to you. When you understand that, your eyes open to something so big. Your eyes open to the fact that even if you don't pray, those things exist in your life. Now somebody is going to think I'm saying we don't pray. You see? (laughs) I'm only saying your prayer life changes from asking to thanking. Do you realize that it is too late for you not to be blessed? It is too late. It is too late. For you not to be blessed. If God dealt with men in the flesh. With a relationship with him in the Old Testament dispensation. And the blessing on them he could not turn to a curse. He says, how shall I curse whom the Lord hath blessed? It is not in the mind of God to reverse what he has placed upon you. It's not there. Somebody, oh, but apostles, some people started well and their lives have changed and they've lost it all. They some they didn't know. There is something they didn't know. They didn't lose it. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. What is upon you cannot leave. Somebody say it. What is upon me cannot leave. Say it again. What is upon my life cannot leave me. It is mine. I lambano it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do you think I'm worried that you'll be a success? You are already a success. I'm not believing to God for you to be a success. I'm not praying that you're going to shake this world. I am fully persuaded. It doesn't mean that situations don't happen. We all have low times. We all have situ- days when things just don't work right. But we don't lose our eyes. We don't lose our fixation. The Bible says, set your eyes on what? And Paul says, and one thing that I do always is to forget the things that are former and look at the things that are ahead of me. Where Christ is. Hallelujah. So yes, things might not be working the way you want them to work. Don't worry. It's only a matter of time. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've realized sometimes in God, our laws are depths. I don't know whether I've made sense. Sometimes in God, our laws are depths. And those depths determine the heights. That is why Paul tells you, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Some of you, what you're going through, oh, 
You're just digging deeper for establishment. And I'm telling you, it's the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. Haven't you heard of stories like that in the Bible? Where they put a guy in a ditch and think that's his end. Kumbe, the guy is becoming governor soon. Oh, look at the guy who looks at you in that ditch and says, ah, look, his God forsook him. He's not with him anymore. And when it's so that you didn't have God, you rise again. You rise again. That's why you don't celebrate the fall of a saint. Because you don't know when they get up how high they go. Oh, you, can, you might not know how high they will go when they go up. So sometimes you look at people in situations and then one day they wake up and boah, something explodes in their lives and we think they repented. <laughs> no, it's not that some repented. No, some it was just time. That is why I tell people, soon I'm teaching something in the September, because I'm starting to train ministers. That's why I'm telling people, when the Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen, or elect, okay? There's a transition between the calling and the election. And there's a preservation on the elect, that you might not claim as a called man. That is why the Bible says, for who shall lay charge, charge on the elect of God. Who shall lay charge on the elect of God? Who? Because that election puts you under a certain praise the Lord. Protection. For it is God that justifies. Now the challenge is that every man which is elect might not know that there is, there is a justification on election. And that justification is way bigger, way bigger than what people think about you. It can raise you up again. It can raise you up again because you're elect. Now, called men, C-A, L-E-D, claim that scripture. But you'll understand one day. It's not for all who are called. It's for them which are elect. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus. That's Africa. Now, let's go to something. I need to to, to paint something here. So Jesus goes and says, I thank the Father because you always hear me. In fact, I was not supposed to say it, but because of these which stand with me and I hear him, let me say, Lazarus, come forth. You know, if Jesus was alone, you would have seen an epic picture of him coming to that grave. And then a man coming out and then Jesus goes back. <laughs> now, when we talk about the move of the Spirit in the last days, miracles are going to change the way they used to be. <laughs> Men are going to walk next to Learn men and just, just walk beside them and the Lord shall hear. <laughs> and the Lord shall hear. And their shadow. You remember Peter? He says, they just used to put sick people on the road. And because he was moving in answered prayer, even the shadow had to carry that glory. Somebody say, it is mine. It is mine. Now it takes a lot of understanding and it will take too much pride to speak in that time. <laughs> because them which be with you understand. Anyway, let's go back to the point here. Jesus Christ says something that blew my mind. It was okay to say, I thank you because you've heard me. But then he added the word, thou hearest me always. Saints, first pause for a moment and imagine a man who God hears always. Prayer becomes a responsibility. You stop rushing to ask. Because you are very careful about what the consequences are 
when you had always. Hallelujah. You're very conscious what the consequences are when you know that the Father hears you always. Imagine there was a man on the face of this earth who walked and God had him always. Every time he thought about something and he put it before the Father, it was done. Every time. Imagine right now. God answered four of your prayers now. Four. Some of you, the way you think. <laughs> what is in your heads? Uganda can't look the way it is. There are people here, if God just answered, you, uh, who am I speaking to? Just four. Four prayers. Bank of Uganda would be closed the next day. Nakasero market would shift. Malls will come your side of town. I mean, imagine one prayer. Imagine you woke up and you're sure that every time you pray, God hears you. Imagine it. When you're sure that every time you pray, God hears you. Every time you pray, God hears you. There was a guy I know, he went to London one day. The United Kingdom. <laughs> Whatever it is. So he goes to London one of those days. was his, I think, uh, senior six vacation. Many years ago, it was many, many years ago. So it used to be dumping sites. People used to dump TVs, what? And this guy reached there and he looked at her. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's wrong with these white guys? They're throwing gold. He carried one TV, he took it home. The next day he carried another, he took it. Another time he picked a radio, he took it. A walkman, he took it. After like three weeks, he had filled his auntie's house. Are you hearing me? And then after that, something remarkable started to happen. He would go on the street and see something nice. And then he remembers he died in half space. So, he also... <laughs> he remembered what he can substitute. So he comes, he sees this is better, he comes with it at home. Even him, he started to what? <laughs> to die. <dump. laughs> That was a man with the abundance of things people didn't want in their house. <laughs> he bought a little small car and then it, it was like a, a small, like it was, a, it was like a, a van. He put everything in. He shipped it in Kampala. You understand? It was a miracle. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But the thought that a guy could walk the streets and just speak. He, he couldn't believe it at first. That people are throwing. <laughs> do, do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? People are throwing what is... You understand? Now we are transitioning into a generation of flat TV screens and smart TVs, ultra high definition 4K. There was a time we had TVs which... <laughs> Who remembers those days? Those TVs which used to snake us. You watch it and it becomes hot. Then your father comes and checks it. Mwarabia TV. <laughs> you finish watching. You, you, you get a, a, a wet cloth. You switch off, you go in the bedroom and act like you've not been watching, then you read like this. Then the man comes back. <laughs> Who was watching TV? <laughs> <laughs> Who remembers those days? Yeah, if you were born in Africa, you went through it. If you didn't go through it, you didn't have a TV. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyway, I need to make a point here. 
So the Lord asked me the question I want to ask you today because I, I need you to enter something in a few minutes from now. He asked me, what would it feel like when a man is hard always? And he's answered, always. That man starts to have responsibility. Now, ultimate question is, should I now adopt the responsibility of a man which anticipates an always answer? Or should I stay indifferent, waiting to know whether he hears me? Can I, can I ask it again? Should I now learn the responsibility, the ultimate line of responsibility of a man who anticipates that the Lord answers him always? Or should I be indifferent and wait to affirm or confirm in my spirit that he hears me always? If you're waiting to know whether he hears you, that's going to change this evening. But if you want to know that it's possible for God to hear you always, then the most important thing is to now take responsibility and learn the responsibility expected of a man who has everything at his exposure. For all things are permissible, Paul says, but they are not beneficial to me. This is Paul. All are permissible. All are permissible. Paul reached a place where he knew that anything he wanted he could access. He knew that all these things were lawful unto him, but he refused to be brought under the power of those things. Imagine when all things are permissible. Are they permissible? Yes, they are. Do we know they are permissible? We don't know some of us and some we do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But when we understand that, you realize that God's mind to you and me is to understand the responsibility of a man to whom God always hears than just waiting to see whether God hears him. Or dealing with a man who doesn't even know that God hears. I don't know if I'm making sense. Am I making sense? Because remember, the Bible speaks of his chastisements. And the literal word for chastisement is God's deliberate mind to discipline you enough to receive certain things. When the Bible says that he chastises those he loves, God does not chastise souls and bodies. To a New Testament creature, he chastises spirits. He works certain things in your DNA as a character to walk into those things that were freely given to you by God. Now you read a scripture like, For in Christ all things are here. Imagine, in Christ all things are here. And what? Amen. That means that when a man is in Christ, everything is yes. And everything is be done unto you according to what you want. Do you believe that everything in Jesus is yes? It means that God has created a vast life where everything we want is yeah. But he's dealing with a man who doesn't have that responsibility in prayer. What will he ask? How will he ask it? Some of you people are not dead because you don't have guns. Only because you don't have guns. If you had a gun, you'd have killed someone already. Some of you, you're coming to pray because you don't have a job. The job has helped us. Adam hasn't come yet. Let him come. Let him come, you'll see fire. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So then it's important for us to now stress and understand what is this line of responsibility and to which degree is the responsibility wanted of me and as a minister or a Christian, how how do I respond to this? Matthew chapter 13 verse 52. He speaks of men which are instructed in the kingdom. You see, some people are, they say, oh, we are in the kingdom of God. Oh, the kingdom of God has come upon us. Oh, we will receive the kingdom of God. Yes, but... How many of us are instructed in the kingdom of God? Instructed in the kingdom. Amplified. He says, then he said unto them, Therefore, every teacher and interpreter of the sacred writings who has been instructed about and trained for the kingdom of heaven and has become a disciple is like a householder, the Bible says, who brings forth out of his storehouse, also out of his storehouse, treasure that is what? New. And treasure that is old, the fresh 
as well as the familiar. When you are instructed in the kingdom, when you're instructed, trained in the things of the spirit, you bring out familiar things out of your spirit, but you bring out fresh things too. Now the word there for familiar is old things. Old things. I prefer the word old because not every old thing is familiar. That's why the KJV uses the word old. Even this one uses the word old. He bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. In our words, in you dwells the oldest wisdom and the freshest revelation. It's coming out of your spirit. Why? Because you're instructed in the kingdom. You're instructed in the kingdom. Now the word kingdom there is realm. Now remove realm and put... Sorry, remove kingdom and put realm. He says, he said unto them, every teacher, interpreter of the sacred writings, who has been instructed about and trained for the realm of heaven and has become a disciple, is like a householder, a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse treasure that is new and treasure that is old, the fresh as well as the familiar. Out of your spirit, new things come every day. Yet you carry the oldest wisdom. When you speak, they think you're like 200 years old. And sometimes when you speak, they know that this comes from heaven. It is fresh from heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, that is easy for a preacher to understand. But it is hard for a businessman to understand. It might not be as easy for, the, for, the, for that engineer to understand or for that consultant X to understand. But you see, it's the same thing. Whether you're a consultant, you need new ideas. And you need to have the oldest wisdom. Whether you're a businessman, you need to have new innovations and ideas. Yet you have the oldest wisdom. When you're in a generation, when you're in a dispensation where you carry the oldest of all, you know the past and you can create something new. Oh my God, your life is different. Why? Because you give answers. You give answers. For those of you who have worked in a professional world, you understand why men honor years of experience. Three years of working experience. Four years of working experience. Because they expect that the basic things are known of you. Professionalism, time uh, consciousness, common decency, follow-up, feedback, collect, feedback collection, communication to and fro, responding to events, conflict management. There are things that they expect that at somebody at a workplace, because of your work environment, you know how to respond to certain things. It's natural in you. And why do they want that? It's because they want to avoid years of again retraining. Because that means they, that the employer will save enough time. Are we together? Now that is of the world. Come into the things of the spirit too. When a man is instructed in the things of God, that man does not waste time in issues. You see, it's one thing when you function under a gift of the spirit. It's another when you function instructed with the gift. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. When you're instructed with a gift, okay, when you're functioning under a gift without instruction, you tend to produce results that you cannot explain. And some people say, because they can't explain, in that gap they put the grace of God. So you ask them, oh, so how did you do this? It's the grace of God. Come on. It is still the grace of God. <laughs> I don't know that you understand what I'm saying. Yes, you're telling us it's the grace of God in the middle here that is doing all that it's doing. But I can also submit to you that it's also the grace of God to know how to do it. That is a land man and a learning man. Those are two different people. He says, for the Lord has given me the tongue of the land. When he received the tongue of the land, he stopped questioning what to say. He learned to, to do how. He, he learned to respond to the hows of ministry. He said, I said, the Lord has given me the tongue of the land that I should know how, not what. How, not what. How, not what. How to speak a word in season to him that is weary. And he wakened my, me morning by morning and he wakened my ear to hear of the land man. When a man is learned, he no longer asks God, what am I going to preach? He just asks, how am I going to preach it? 
When a man is instructed in the kingdom, he doesn't say, how, what business am I going to do? No, he says, how am I going to do this business? How am I going to build this ministry? How am I going to run this marriage? How am I going to build this project? How am I going to run this company? How am I going to restore this? How am I going to get this healing? How am I, how? Because the what is no longer a question for a man who is instructed. When a man is not instructed, the questions that go to God is what? What, God? What? 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 And then the God starts to tell him, okay, this is it. This is that. This is this. You do this and then you do this and then you do this. And after doing this, you do that. And that's wonderful. But there comes a point where, by experience, I have known. You see? It's knowledge. You remember when Laban was dealing with Jacob? And Jacob says, give me my inheritance for I am to go. I've Worked for you all these years. I have now my wives and children. We become so big. Because Laban had started to cheat this fellow. And Laban refused this guy to go. And he says, for I have understood by experience. I have known by experience that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Hey, by the way, that thing is beautiful. Some people are blessed because of other people. The day that person leaves you. <laughs> Laban. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making sense. So, it is wonderful for me to stumble in something by God's grace. But it's better when I know how. Because it means every time I stumble in something, we, s- we save the time of what? Of explaining ourselves. Hallelujah. We save the time of what? Of explaining ourselves and going through the ABCs. Because if I don't know how and in the middle somehow I screw up, it means that I might not get the results that I got last time because I'm in guesswork. And then we still say, it is grace. If God moves sometimes, it is grace. And in the times when he doesn't want to move, it is grace. Listen, it's like demonstration. I can demonstrate the power anytime. It's just how, not the words of power. The power is available. I've been instructed in demonstration. In my spirit. How? (laughs) Now my mic is low. Is it my mic? Power. Power. Crap for Bruce. He needs a wife. So I'll sing. And he's pretending like he didn't hear. <laughs> Ah, Bruce. Now listen. Where was we? How? So. Now listen. So. God wants to raise you to a place where you're no longer thinking, what am I going to do with this? Where you know what you're exactly going to do. Because. Yeah, don't worry. So, now I've lost my flow. It's coming back, don't worry. So, when we are working with the house of ministry, the house of life, the house of, 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 of your personal life, the house of, of your personal dealings with God, you realize that the reason why I say that you save time is there are things a man knows by experience. Oh, that I have done this for 20 years. I've done this for 16 years. I've done this for 5 years. I always know the in and out. When you do that, you usually say with the details. A professional person understands what I'm saying. You usually say with the details. I'll give you an example. If you're dealing with an experienced back office staff, they're doing back office. They're doing work in the back office. They are doing an operations role, okay? Work can come from an front office view or your customer service or desk, whatever business it is. And then a small little signature 
is forgotten. You understand? And maybe in your company X, the policy is that we want dual custody. We want four eyes on every document. Meaning that we need two signatures to mean that a transaction or anything is not done without the permission of one person and probably a superior person to make sure that if one had a wrong heart, the other one would check, right? Checks and balances. Okay? Now, this thing comes to a back office person who has just gone in the back and he has not registered that detail. So, signature comes and then he looks at the document. Why? And then sees one signature but does not know the difference between having two or the importance of having two. And a fraud goes through that company. And millions of shillings are lost. At that point, millions of shillings are lost. If not because this staff is tired, it is because he's not knowledgeable. So do you see that without experience, you can lose millions of shillings? Now, get that in ministry too. If you're not dealing with a man which is experienced in the things of the spirit, one act done wrong can cost the ministry so great. And if you build the very things that you destroyed, the Bible says you make yourself a transgressor. The mystery of transgression sometimes is wider than some people think. Some people think transgression is lying, cheating, doing all these kinds of things. Yes, those are basic. He says little children, okay? But you see, there's also offense in not knowing what to do. And that is why our love abides in all knowledge and judgment that we might examine or approve. The things that are most excellent. Is it excellent? Yes. Is it not excellent? No. He says that we may not have offense on the day of Christ. Because on that day, there are things that God questions and he realizes there are certain things you do because you don't know. Because you don't know. And if you're dealing with ministry, you're dealing with lives. Multitudes of lives are going to be directly affected because you don't know. If you're dealing with business, you're going to lose the most important deal that day. And you're going to stay believing God and confessing right Father in the name of Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. You can say all you want, but if you don't understand the how of anything, chances are that you'll take longer on some that should come quicker. God has called us to do things quicker. Somebody say amen. amen. God has called you and I to do some things quicker. And it's possible to redeem time through the things you do by reason of experience. Now the essence of the Holy Ghost is simple. To align you to the life of God that you might be quickened. That you don't do things by reason of just having gone through all those drills for 20 years. But you do things because the Holy Spirit working in you has done those things for 20 years. He healed in the beginning. He was there at the creation. When they were raising dead bodies, he was there. When Lazarus was coming out of the grave, the Holy Ghost was there. When the blind were opening eyes and the deaf were speaking and the dumb were hearing. So the dumb were speaking and the deaf were hearing. The Holy Spirit was present. There is nothing that is created and he wasn't there. Now when I have the Holy Ghost, I have experience. So when I'm laying a hand on a sick man, to me it is news, but to him it's the oldest craft. Are you hearing me? I can choose to move by what I think is new or rely on him who knows everything old. And before you know that, you realize it's the same old thing. Relying on him, you get the results anyway. You get the results anyway. Some people don't know how to relate to the Holy Spirit. They don't know how to move with the Holy Spirit. They don't know how to yield to the Holy Spirit. They don't know how to flow with him. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has a flow. He has a flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to go deep before I finish. So, because of this instance, he has given you an experience of a man which is instructed in the kingdom, in the things of the heaven. And the Bible says, and that man, out of him flow all things. Like, if you want to deep out, dig out the oldest wisdom, it's inside that woman. And if you want to get the freshest thing from Jehovah God, it's still inside that woman. Why? Because she is instructed in the things of the kingdom. When you're instructed, how can you fail when every day you have something new? Come and answer me. How can you fail when you speak something new every day? You invent something new every day. This is the principle of this world. It's the law of exchange. Men exchange old with what's new. Or exchange new with what's old if it makes sense. That's exchange. Look at the world and how it works. Samsung Galaxy S7. Samsung Galaxy X6. And then the iPhone 5S. And then iPhone 5 Plus. I don't know. 6. 6 Plus. You understand? Now we've changed. 
We're no longer doing the note six. We're skipping to the note seven. You understand? And you realize everything is new. Oh, Mercedes Benz GLK 2016. Oh, Audi this 2017. You see, you realize that the world moves and rewards innovation and invention. Anything new has a glory to it. I said anything new has a glory to it. Now, that's the essence of the kingdom. He says that pertaining to his kingdom, there is increase and the peace they are all. And he says, when it comes to the kingdom of God, he says, of the increase of his government, he says, and peace, there shall be no end. God is not going to stop to increase you. Let me say it again. Unless you're not building his kingdom. But if you are in the kingdom, brother, God is not going to stop to increase you. I am persuaded that you're going to increase today, this evening, than you did a few hours ago. I am persuaded that you're increasing tomorrow morning than you were last year. And whether you want it or not, next year you're in a better place. Because that's the principle. You're dealing with the kingdom. Somebody say, I'm increasing. I feel it in my spirit. I feel it in my body. It is inside my bones. It vibrates in my heart. It is moving around in my mind. I am moving ahead. I'm increasing in the name of Jesus. I'm doing more tomorrow. New stuff is coming. In the name of Jesus Christ. The oldest stuff is there too. For the man that needs it. But I'm new every day. I give new answers. I give new solutions. In the name of Jesus. I bring new ideas. I bring new inventions. In the name of Jesus. Receive it and say it's mine. The latest cures are supposed to come from Fanero. Sorry, you can also say it for your church. The latest scientific inventions, they're supposed to be coming from here. The deepest mysteries in the gospel. Go on here. Everything new is supposed to be coming out of you. Every time you come, for example, on Thursdays to pray, don't just come. Come to get something new. Go home a better person and say this is new. Because once something new comes in your spirit, it's only a matter of time. God will always create the need. Men buy stuff because they are simply tired of old stuff. And that principle will live as long as the earth remains. Seed, harvest, summer, winter, cold and heat. For as long as the earth remains, that principle will stay. Do you think every day I will come to church and hear the oldest stuff? Every day. No, I want to hear something new. The old can come. I need it, but I also need something new. It's the only way I can believe that I'm advancing on this pendulum. Are we together? God must work in you something new. Behold, I do a new thing. (laughs) For it shall spring forth. It shall not tarry. Why does he want to do it? Because he knows there is a place and provision for a man who is ready to receive something new. Something new. Something new in your spirit. Something. It's there. It is new. Some of you are going to do ministries that have never been seen. Men are going to look at you and say, this is new. This. This is new. This, this, this is new. Even in your workplace. And that is why we preach to working people a lot. Because we want you to get to a point where even in your workplace, you're the star. You're the star. If God wants to move that company from million dollars to billions of shillings, it has to be your idea. Brother, you can sit on the table and say, let us deal now. What up? What up? It was my idea. How can we fail the world? How can we fail in this world when we know the how? Do you know how many men are paying millions of shillings because they don't know how? How many men right now on flights going to India to spend millions of dollars and they're going to come back because they don't know how? They just don't know how to heal the sick. How can you be poor when you can heal? How? How can you be disadvantaged when you have the solution that thousands of men are looking for? Somebody one time told me, and told me, yeah, well, in the last days I noticed the Bible says, you know, the, the, the beast shall come and uh, no man shall be able to sell or buy without this thing. And somebody asked me, so what do the saints in that time do? Them which have learned. <laughs> I told him they will have new ideas. See, the Lord shall provide new concepts that the men in the world can't live without. It's possible. 
It's possible. It's possible. Listen. Somebody is going to come out of this room today. And your life is going to be redefined for good. Because you carry, you carry the next best idea. You carry the next best revelation. You carry that one thing. It's like a key. And it's simply going to open the people into another world. You have it. It's in your hand. Why? Because you have the Holy Ghost. You have the Holy Ghost. He's the master of this experience. And he knows it very well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me show you one thing before I finish. Scripture. John. Chapter. First John chapter 5. Now I want to define the responsibility here. Verses 14. The Bible says, First John chapter 5 verses 14. Are you learning something? Huh? It says, and this is the... Conf- <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Somebody said, this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And the next verse says, And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We know it. We know it. Let me tell you, it goes beyond whether he wants to do it or not to the point of has he heard or he hasn't. Are you sure you know he has heard you? Because if you know that he has heard your prayer, then you know that you shall receive all the petitions which he has. But you see, how can you know that he has heard except you understand the will? Now let me explain this. Many people think, and I, I, I hear Christians a lot saying this, and I'm going to break a certain doctrine out of your head. Many people say, I don't know that it's the will of God for me to do this. I don't know that it's the will of God for me to do that. I don't know that it's the will of God for me to do this. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, in your spirit, huh? in your spirit, God does not relate with you on the mind that he even assumes that you don't know. That is why Paul says he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. The will of God, you're not supposed to, it's, it's, I don't know who I'm talking to. He says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, having made known, having made known, having made known, having made, not that he will do it next week or next year, no, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. You know what? The good pleasure in him, purposed, for you not to believe to know the will, but for you to know. When he created the new creature, he put the knowledge of his will in the inside of you. How do I know this is my job? You will know. Oh, but, but, but I'm seeking to know. Then you're not instructed in the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom does not... You know. You just know. You know that this is it. You know that this is, this is where. You know that this is him. You know that this is it. You know it. You know you know. I know. So, God wants to get you from a place of believing God for something to a place where you know something. I know. This is mine. Why? Because you see, the Bible says, now we carry the mind of Christ. We carry the mind of Christ. Do you know what it means to carry the mind of Christ? It means that God, you don't think the way He thinks. No. You think as He thinks. The thinking part of a new, of a new creature is not in following after His thoughts. No. It is in the real-time accuracy of his thoughts with yours. That reconciliation. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So in that line of instruction, in that line of instruction, 
you will realize that every time you speak to him, it's as though he's fellowshipping with his own heart. He's fellowshipping with his own heart. Remember creation. Let us make. Were they in agreement? Of course they were. Was there a point of asking that one would divert in agreement? None had and could divert out of that agreement. Why? Because the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost were one in the Spirit. Elohim. The plural sense of Him. But a place where the place of agreement, as of whether it was the Spirit which spake, or the Son which spake, or the Father which spake, it did not matter who spake, they were all in agreement of the same mind. That the thought patterns, even though they are sent out as instructions, they are entirely the meditation of the heart of God. He says, and this is love made perfect. That you might have confidence on that day. When you need to make something move. This is the confidence. That we ask, if we ask according to his will, he hears our prayer. But he has made known unto us the mystery. Of his will. That means that a child of God no longer has to ask themselves whether they are asking in the will of God anymore. It's very clear if you ask anything in my name. Anything in my name. Anything. But are you sure everything? You see, the moment you corrupt your brain from the simplicity which is in Christ, God won't hear you always. Because he's going to deal with a place of trying to explain to you that you're trying to make me tell you what to do instead of asking me how to do it. I don't know whether I'm making sense. I don't know whether I'm making sense. Do, we are moving into a place where now that responsibility comes and then you realize, okay, when the Lord Jesus could ask for anything and it could be given, what were the things he asked of the Father? He has for cars, DVD players, mobile phones. The Bible says no man was greater, no prophet was greater, born of woman, than John the Baptist. No man spake prophecy like John, but he only spoke one sentence. The kingdom of God is nigh. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And God said there is nobody born of a woman has risen greater than that man. Why? Because God shows us what is greater. The kingdom. John dealt with the kingdom to come. We deal with the kingdom that has come. Now, when you read Matthew 11, 11, you will realize that that is a place where the gates of the spirit world open. The eternal things start to draw sense in every man's life that scripture that scripture he says among them that are born of women there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist notwithstanding that he that is least in the realm of heaven is greater than John the greatest preaching in that time was the coming of the kingdom everything was okay but there was one thing the coming of the kingdom we are of them which are now in that kingdom, preaching the kingdom is come. The kingdom is come. So it's okay for a man to say, let thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But for me now, it is come. It is come. It is come. And his will is done on the earth, even as it is in heaven. Why? Not because he has opened us to access it, but because he has minds which are as he is. He has men on the earth who think exactly the way he is. When you start to pattern your brain and then configure it to this thought, you start to ask, how would a man be when he can ask for everything? You start to realize that many of you receive, ask and receive not because you want to consume it on your own lust. The mind of the spirit is not invented in your life enough to receive certain things because even though they are good as you ask for them the end of it is the lust of your eyes the lust of your flesh and the pride of life and he says and they ask and receive not because they ask amiss how can they ask amiss because they want to consume it on their own lust 
they put aside the will. And amazingly, this thing is funny. Many people misunderstand this, and I've seen many people are lasting in what they define as purpose. In Corinthians, it says, even if you give your body to be burned, but have not love. In other words, it is possible for a man to die as a martyr, and everyone says she died for the gospel. And when you check his heart or her heart, you realize he lusted for the anointing. He says, even if you give all your goods to the poor, it is not enough to say that because you're a good giver, therefore you love God. It is not enough to say that because you're serving God every day, therefore you love God. Examine ye yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. There's a place where I cannot examine you, but this word that comes out of my spirit, entering you, cuts you asunder, separates your bone and marrow, and exposes your heart and thought for what it really is. Woman, why do you want a healing anointing? Brother, why do you want to prophesy? Sister, why do you want to be deep? Why do you want your touch to expand? Why do you want an increase in your business? Why do you want a man? The many are lasting. And because they are lasting, the mind of the spirit cannot work in them. Why? Because God is divine purpose. The mind, God must take preeminence. He requires that priority. Everything that I do, I must weigh it against what I'm lasting to do. Do I want to do it so people can say, wow, now this guy is cool. He can drive this, he has this. Oh, I'm doing it entirely in the mind of the spirit. The Christ could have asked for the latest Mercedes and it would appear in Jerusalem. It would appear in Jerusalem. If Jesus was like some of the people I see in our day, he would not even be walking. He would be flying in the air every time. Because it's last with some of our saints. It is not the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is why the mind which was in him is not in men. For who found it no robbery to be like unto God, but humbled himself even as unto the cross. He took on the form of a servant. He came in the likeness of a man. He dwelt among us. Some people, they are humble because they are not anointed. The day they get anointed, you're not going to be able to shake their hands. They're going to be so busy and anointed. Not really busy, but per se, but so consecrated to deal with a normal man. Let that never be hard. That you feel more superior because you have a high education and you speak nice English than your immediate neighbor. For in Christ, neither circumcision or uncircumcision availeth much but the new creature in Christ Jesus. So God, God has to deal with your heart. Some of you, you want to be used of God. But your heart. A young man one time came to me and told me, Apostle, I want to build a big ministry. I think you can teach me how. And the Holy Spirit told me, he has no part, no lot in this. Simon the sorcerer. He was born again. He followed the believers everywhere. While they're doing miracle signs and wonders, he watched everything. And he, he had believed. But the Bible says that he comes to the disciple and he says, I want to buy it. To some, he might have even not put a demand on the price. He would have just gotten the man and given it in the kingdom. And people say, we thank God that brother Sam, I mean Simon, bought equipment. But at the end of the day, the reason why the man bought equipment was not because he wanted to serve God, but because he still had a certain spirit within him in the olden line, while he was still the power of the children of Israel, then as a sorcerer, that always exposed his heart and body and flesh to praise. And the man of God tells him, you neither have part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Listen, there is nothing God cannot do in you. Just check the state of your heart. Because out of it flow the issues of life. Out of it flow the issues of life. That is why he says, my son, give me thine heart. David says, I examined my heart and found there in integrity. But when I gave it unto you, my Lord, you examined it and found another. I mean, this guy, he, he thought he was the most integral fellow. He had a high sense of integrity. And then one time, God examines him and starts to show him, look, boss, even though you feel like this, your heart in this matter is not right. Why do you want a job? 
Why do you want that increase? Why do you want that promotion? Why do you want that marriage? Why do you want that ministry? Why do you want to see in the spirit? Why do you want to hear in the spirit? Why do you want to do miracles, signs and wonders? The mind of an instructed man in the kingdom carries the reasons of divine purpose. The man which is not instructed alas. And when you're exposed in your life through lust, you'll be consumed by the very thing that is supposed to raise you up. And many people die therein. Because they don't know the difference between true love and lasting. And that's why the flesh must die. (laughs) For we which have believed on Christ have crucified our flesh. In other words, there is nothing you're seeking for in the glorification of your flesh. Many people come in the presence of Christ very selfish. Very selfish. People call me at 2 a.m., 1 a.m. in the morning calling me, Oh, Apostle, I want this. Oh, Apostle, pray for me this. Apostle, pray for me that. I want God to do this in my life. And you examine this man's heart or this woman's heart. And you very simply look at them and realize God is like a stock market. They're just begging to consume on their own personal lust. And some of them are to look at them straight in the face and tell them, even if I'm praying for you to minister to your comfort, what you're asking for, you cannot receive, for your heart is not right. Your heart is not right. Do you know how many ministers have failed to, 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 to go ahead in the things of the ministry? Why? Because every time God looks at the man's heart, Yes, the guy gives. Yes, the guy sows. Yes, the guy loves the brethren. He does everything right. And you ask yourself, but God, I've done everything right. I think maybe you've set certain people to be blessed and some of us are never going to be blessed. No. Go back, examine your heart, brother. You might find yourself lasting for the things that are supposed to be working in you by the love of God. The Christ sat with sinners and ate with the poorest people in this world. He became all things that he might save some. He was the son of God. He could have asked for everything he wanted. But there was a necessity of responsibility that kept his flesh in check to distribute only to the need of the gospel. And anything outside that was sinking sand. Many of you, if only the liberties of this access were given to you, if only the law of liberty was revealed to you to its fullness, and the Lord opened your eyes to the back end of eternity. The lasting of the things in eternity would kill you only because you're consumed by the glory of the beauty of those things without understanding the integrity that it comes with it. And that is why men used to walk in the spirit and go in the heavenly places, see glassy seas and then see angelic. And then before you know that, by the time they come back, they don't have a message of divine purpose. They have a distinct experience of things that lasted for. And men also went to the presence of God, started to alas for the very things God. I want to visit heaven. I want to see how it looks like. Says that you do that. Do what? Blessed are ye which believe. For even though you have seen him not, but yet you love him. Because some of them, it's not that God cannot give it to you. It's because when he looks at your heart, you just want to get a place to glory. Says that also you, you can stand in front of multitudes and tell them, I went to heaven on this day. And that is why many of you, your testimonies do not carry the multiplication of grace on the lives of the hearers who hear them. Because it is done on you and for you, but it's not done in you. And he says, I would rather not speak, save of the things which Christ has wrought in me, to make the Gentiles obedient, both by word and deed. The grace of God multiplies on the lives of men around you when you stop lasting. Because at the end of the day, some of you one day are so rich to pray. You're going to be so rich to tithe. How can I give? A young man came one day, I prayed for him. He got money and he told me, I have a problem. How do I tithe 10 million? How do I tithe 20 million? And I said, wow. So you got this, is, you're not even yet a million dollars rich. You're struggling with tithing 10 million. Some of you, we have you here because you don't have money yet. You don't have jobs yet. The guy hasn't come the day he comes. And that is why I pray for you. That we are so selfish. 
Christians are so selfish. They're so selfish. When Jesus was dealing with his disciples, he told you, I sent you without saddle or buckle, not even a joint or a bag with you or pass. Did you lack? And the disciples told him, nay, we lack nothing. Why did they lack nothing? Because the man who sent them had provided for them everything that pertains to life and godliness and was fully persuaded that when he sends you in this job, he will look after you so fully. Look after you so fully. This man used to pay taxes from the mouth of a fish. The man with such an ability could have woken up in the morning one day and created millions of dollars or kilograms of gold in his room. But what were they for? What were they for? If they were not building the, 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 the gospel, if they were not for the kingdom, what are they for? What do you come? You, some of you just, oh, I come because I need a job. I'm so desperate. I need this. Yes. Okay, you're going to get it. Then after what? For all these things we see are temporal. But the things that we see not are eternal. That's the difference between a man who receives riches on the earth and a man who stores up treasures in heaven. Everything that man does has a heavenly implication and results that echo through eternity. That is the man of the kingdom. He says, for uh, that man is like a household, a person of a, a householder who has a storage of treasure, not riches, treasure of riches, treasure. He says, the man which is instructed in the kingdom, he's like a householder. He says, out of him, in that man's spirit, he says, they, he brings forth out of his storehouse a treasure, a treasure, a treasure. So that your healing ministry becomes a treasure because it teaches. Your preaching ministry becomes a prayer because it teaches. Somebody came to me and told me, I saw men which were educated on Kampala Road and I felt I needed to see God. Do you know I have heard that we won more than 8,000 souls in Yesu Yasasula? Where would we have fallen? 8,000 souls to preach to. And how many men spent their money just to see souls come to Christ? And how many did nothing? And every day they come in the presence of God. They want to be anointed. They want to get a job. They want to be filled. They want to be consecrated. They want God to use them so mightily. Brother, your heart is not right. You have no parts, no lot. For out of the abundance of the heart, so the mouth speaks. Where a man's heart is, his treasure is also. Your treasure is where your heart is. And your heart is where your treasure is. What do you treasure in God? You still want a job. Those are very small things to ask. Ask for things money can't buy. Let me tell you, we used to have a group of guys we used to pray with. Up to today, I still know these guys. But I remember the time when we had just met God. We used to go and pray mountains for hours. And we just used to say, God, use us. Use us. Use us. Use us. Use us. Today people don't pray those prayers. Or some which has to be used. They ask to be used because they like the camera. They just like the camera. Now, there's a man who, who God had always. And look at how he lived in his life. Every answered prayer of the Christ was a message. That when you're a businessman, everything you do is a message. You're preaching. That consultant, you're preaching. You engineer, you're preaching. You lawyer, everything that comes out of your spirit is preaching. I told somebody, Jesus never did one miracle that didn't teach. Everything he did, whether he walked on water. He didn't walk on water for them to know that he was a man of God. No. He walked on water because he wanted to teach what it means for a man to walk by faith and defy the laws of the earth. And we learn things in Peter. Every miracle of the Christ has a hidden mystery. I don't want to just teach. I want to teach with something hid. I want to minister with something hid. I want to demonstrate something hid. If you're still at the level where you demonstrate power or do anything for men to approve you a worker, you lost it. Because the primary approval is with God. He says, study the word that you might be approved and to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Our approval and salvation is Christ. The word approval there is Stephanos. That is the man Stephen. He is a cook, but he has too much approved in his spirit. And if there is necessity, he will do miracles, signs and wonders. 
He preached until Christ left the field. And he says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. Literally, the Christ, God stood up for Stephanos. They approved one of God. Yet look at what he was doing, serving tables. That's why he says, let ye which think that you're greatest in the kingdom, be least. Live a life and be least. Don't feel too special to be used of God. Don't feel, listen, we are anointed. If you know us, you know it. But this anointing is for service. If you're not getting married to serve, don't get married. You have no part, no lot. If you're not doing ministry to serve, if you're not getting a job to become a better servant of Almighty God, don't even waste your time. Today men want to hear things, they are eating ears, want to hear, pray for me, apostle, give me a prophetic word, apostle, give me this, apostle, I want that, and they say, ah, everybody's anointed. And then they go back home, and then tomorrow I want more, I want more, they are begging, I want more, I want more. It's about you, it's always about you. What about the kingdom of God? What about the multitudes? What was the instruction he commanded as they go ye into the world? He didn't say amass limousines and benzers and BMWs, no. He says, preach this gospel, heal the Seek, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers. For lo, I'm with you up to the end. Let's go to John and I finish. And this is what happened. Look at this glory. Oh, at in, 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 uh, in, in, in the gospel in Matthew. You remember the, the Matthew? Yes. No, 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 not that. Matthew 13. What were at before? Uh huh. He said unto them, therefore, every teacher, interpreter of the sacred writings who has been instructed about or trained for the kingdom of heaven, has become a disciple, is like a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse a treasure that is new and that is, that is old, the fresh as well as the familiar. And the next verse says, he says, and when Jesus, listen, had finished these parables, these comparisons, he left there. And the next verse says, and coming to his own country, Nazareth, he taught in their synagogue, and they were amazed. With bewildered wonder and they say where did this man get this wisdom and this miraculous power you see that that wisdom must create power you cannot say i'm wise without power you cannot say i'm wise without results you're not wise wise men produce results and the next verse says is this not now listen to something <laughs> the carpenter's son is not his mother called mary and not his brothers james joseph simon and judas and do not all his sisters live among the stars? Where then did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. And they were repelled and hindered from acknowledging his authority and caused to stumble. Why did they have a problem? It is because something started to happen on this man that could not identify him with Joseph, couldn't identify him with Mary, could not identify him with James, could not identify him with Judas, could not identify him with Simon nor his brothers. Now they are thinking, if you didn't get it from your family, where else did you get it? We defy that authority. Because they think that it has to come from a certain set of organization. It has to come from their church. If it doesn't come from their church, it's not of God. If it doesn't come from their umbrella, it cannot be of God. If you didn't go to their Bible school, God didn't use you. Oh, Master, we found a man casting out devils in your name and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And they do not ask themselves the question when he tells them that he, that he does for us cannot be against us. But they forget that Jesus had the ability to even teach a man he didn't walk with. He had the ability to even teach a man he did not walk with. Those are sacred places. Those are sacred places. Let me tell you something that I learned by God. It is by the mind and spirit of redemption for God to distribute wisdom to a man who is not in the natural order of things, in the natural institution of things, or events where it's most likely. And many a time, when that happens, the separation on that man is usually more distinct than the men which move with the camp. And that's why Paul warns us. He says, brethren, if there is something we must see in God, we must go suffer his reproach without the camp. Because the camp is very deceptive. 
Sometimes numbers can make you think that because you're sitting four or five thousand people in a meeting, therefore you're all going to heaven and you'll understand the pattern. Or because the Spirit of God came in that meeting, it means that it's going to, He's going to touch everyone. That is why every man needs their own personal time with God. Those are called wilderness experiences. The Greek word for the word wilderness is, trans, is translated as a place where God places you against the word without any aid of friends, family, or networks. The place where God starts to exalt you, not because you have a wonderful man of God, not because you have a connection in your family, not because you have a person who can connect you to the right person to go to America, but at that particular point where you look upon the mountain and where does your help come from? And it cometh from the Lord. And you know that in this world, God can use anybody, but he can only use them because he had to use them. But even if you look to any man, they can never be your source except Christ. The wilderness. And that is why the Bible says he was led by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. It can only be a leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the only power and entity that can lead a man to such a consecration. When he comes back, the Bible says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. He read scriptures that they read every day in the synagogue, and they said, wow, is this not the son of Joseph? Because once that consecration starts to take place, God starts to put something on you, your family doesn't understand. Your friends don't understand. Your relatives cannot understand. And that is why he says the prophet is with honor, except in his own family and his only countrymen. You don't become indifferent. When Jesus spoke it, he did not mean that you also have to be indifferent to the mantles that are around you. Chances are that the people in your family or the people in your own circle might not recognize it, but it's not wisdom either. He was speaking to men which were not born again. He expects that in this dispensation where we understand, we don't take for granted that God is raising men around us. And if your family doesn't accept it, God will give you another family that will accept it. And if that nation refuses it, he says, seeing that you find yourself not worthy of eternal life, lo, we turn unto the Gentiles. Let me tell you, if Uganda frustrates me, I will go in another nation and make it. I will still make it. Because the blessing of God upon our lives is bigger than whether men accept us or not. This is a relationship that we build. Right now is a consecration taking place. So they look at Jesus and they ask themselves one thing. How come he doesn't look like Joseph? How come he doesn't look like Mary? How come he doesn't look like his brothers and sisters? That's exactly what happens when you get instructed of the kingdom. You stop to look like the men they predicted you along with. The man the disciples found, I believe, had a sacred experience of a wilderness line. Why? Because God counted him among the numbers of whom he had to use, but proximity was a problem to this individual, but not unto Almighty God. And that is why I tell people, God is moving in a way and fashion that is going to start anointing women and men, not in your Bible schools. And not that we don't want Bible school. I recommend it. But not in our churches too. I see that there are somewhere in the hidden places of our nation. They are walking with bare feet, walking back home, pushing wheelbarrows, and their bicycles. They have things they are carrying. They don't even dream they will ever go anywhere. They are not known. God knew that you didn't have the right connection. God knew that you didn't have the right father. God knew that probably your mother might have not understood you. God knew that maybe your sisters might not understand you. God knew that even the friends around you could not do it. And he had to provide for the man which doesn't move with the mass. And therefore you must respect that even without the car, God can still raise a man. Are we able to bear reproach? And what is the essence of that reproach? The reproach is simple. The camp is predictable. 
So if you're doing it, you have to do it the predictable way. If you don't do it the predictable way, you're not a part of us. Yes, there are diversities of gifts, but same spirit. Diversities of demonstration, but the same spirit. Diversities of operation, but the same spirit. He says it is the same God which worketh in all. Speak in other tongues. Take me, mold me. Take a minute. Just take a minute and speak to God. Use me, walk beside me. I give you a life to the corners there. to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Put up your hand and we pray with you. You say, I want to be born again today. I see a hand in the back. I see another hand there. Put up your hand and say, I want Jesus today. Say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. Put it up. Put it up. Come on, put them up, wherever they are. If you need, just repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus. I believe with my heart, I confess with my mouth, that today, you're both Lord and Savior. Amen. If you made that prayer, come and see this man. We shall follow you up. Now let me pray for the rest of us. Put up your hands. I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, and this is my generation. Ye are mighty people, saith the Lord. And he has raised us for such a time as this.
I see God. He's consecrating men on purpose. Anointing men on purpose. Some of you are moving into a life of understanding freedom like never before. The miraculous, the signs, the miracles, the wonders. You're truly going to understand what it means to live in that zone where he answers always but you carry the responsibility that comes with it not to last do me a favor and just take one more minute and speak in other tongues or if you don't have tongues speak in any language Jesus
you, you've been asking God to use you. He's going to use you until you're satisfied. God has a way of satisfying our soul. To some satisfaction is to get a tumor out of a person's body. To us satisfaction is to raise a dead man and open a blind eye. God satisfy you with good things. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, give you that all, now and forevermore. Amen. If you're sick, receive your healing now. Somebody with a heart problem on my left. You're a lady. Your heart has been pricking. God is healing you now. 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 Somebody, you have a headache. But I see inside your head there is an abnormal growth. It's like a tumor. God heal you now. Thank you, Lord. Yes, you will get that job. Yes, God is going to settle you. But on purpose. Some of you, it's the only reason why these things delayed. That you might not last for them. But receive them with a full understanding and responsibility. Which you receive today. God will not withhold anything from you. Indeed in Him, all things are yea. And amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Make manifest.